Okay, it's uh, time to get going here. Um, I'm going to stand for the first little bit here. I'm not sure the protocol. This is my first one of these at uh, Lenaro, I believe. Um, my name is Tim Bird, and uh, I uh, am actually not a Lenaro member. I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the kernel mainline status for mobile chipsets. Uh, there's a project that's been going on in the Linux Foundation. Actually, it's a, a joint project with Lenaro. Um, to address some of the uh, issues with getting uh, mobile phones up into mainline. And so I've just got a couple of slides. Uh, I want the bulk of this session to be kind of a brainstorming, uh, kind of a birds of a feather type session. Uh, collect some ideas from, from you guys about uh, some of the issues that I talk about. Uh, but I'll go ahead and, and now I'll just sit down. <laughs> so, um, Here's the agenda that I put together for, for uh, this session. Uh, go over kind of the big picture status and then uh, talk a little bit about the project that we've got, some of the activities, and then uh, some, some other details and then get into discussion. So the way I've got the, the slide, these slides are online or they should be. Um, if not, I, um, I, I attached them to the Pathful page, but uh, um, I'm not sure if they're visible to other people. Uh, but the discussion, this agenda only covers about half the slides. There's a bunch of resource material that um, I can pull up if we get onto a particular topic uh, that are in the slides and if you want to look at other data that I've gathered. Um, so uh, we'll start with the big picture status though, and that is that uh, most mobile devices have, uh, this is for shipping products, have between one and three million lines of code that's out of tree. Um, and this is uh, based on data for the version 3.4 era of mobile phones, which unfortunately we're still in. Uh, that should tell you something. Uh, uh, there are, I think, a few phones that have shipped with 3.10, but actually there are new phones being shipped as we speak uh, that are on 3.4 kernels. Um, so mobile devices are about three years and 20 versions behind mainline, uh, as sort of referred to as version gap. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, one of the problems with this is that end users and product developers uh, can't use mainline kernels on your hardware. So if you get a new phone uh, from a vendor, even if you can unlock the phone, you cannot run a mainline kernel on it. At least not run a mainline kernel and have any functionality. And in fact, for most phones, you just plain can't run a mainline kernel at all. Uh, it just won't function at all. There's not even enough functionality to get yourself to uh, a, a, uh, a boot prompt or a, a, a console shell. So what this ends up doing is there's very low interaction between the product developers who are working on these products and mainline. Uh, there's very few updates, very few contributions uh, from most uh, mobile phone vendors. Uh, and there's uh, what I refer to as the ghettoization of patches. So you see a bunch of patches. All this patchwork that goes on on the 3.4 kernel, it just gets dumped every release. And so um, if you look at uh, some more details on the amount of code that's out of tree, uh, for most products. Um, you can see this This is an analysis I did earlier this year. Uh, that uh, This is on a 3.4 kernel. Uh, I think with the exception of Huawei, that might have been a 3.0 kernel. Um, but uh, these are based on phones from different manufacturers. Again, this is by downloading the actual source code that was shipped on the phone um, from you know the <coughs> respective vendors, uh, GPL download sites. And there's five different processors uh, represented, uh, four of which are ARM and one of which is Intel. And the Intel result is actually kind of interesting. Intel also had uh, over a million lines of code out of tree. Uh, so it's not just an ARM only phenomenon. Uh, so, um, and you can see it varies between uh, one million to three million lines of code. If you, uh, in terms of, you know, why is this a problem? Just saying that uh, there's a there's a version gap uh, does not indicate what the actual kind of problem is. The problem for manufacturers like Sony Mobile, that's my company, uh, is that working with Linux is kind of too hard. Uh, we have 1,100 developers who have made a patch to the kernel in the last three years, and um, I keep hearing about these companies that can uh, that have like 10 developers and they produce a mobile phone. And I, I I wonder what the heck they're doing. Um, because that's not how hard it is for us. Anyway, um, 
big problem is that device manufacturers are not participating in open source. So there's these institutional barriers, you know, that they're not recognizing the barrier, the benefits of open source. In some cases, they don't know how, they've not done it before. Um, and then version gap. Uh, and version gap is interesting because it's both a cause and an effect of, of these device mainlining problems. So uh, the fact that people are not contributing, that stuff is not upstream, is one of the reasons that it kind of gets behind. Uh, but it also, it's hard to catch up. Once you get behind by a certain version, it's uh, amount, the, it's much harder to take those patches and apply them forward, forward for them. For users, uh, this is kind of a disaster. I feel like we've kind of broken the promise of open source for end users in the mobile phone space. Uh, I cannot, you, you cannot go out and as an end user, uh, run your own kernel on a phone uh, or your own software stack. Um, devices are abandoned, so users don't have any control of the lifespan of their products, and there's no long-term support for that. Um, so that's kind of sad. Uh, sorry, this is kind of the depressing part of my presentation. <laughs> um, this, is, this is what I call the path of uh, broken dreams. Well, here's what happens, and it's very clear why this happens. I mean, there's no surprises in here. Uh, Google gets code from mainline, they put a bunch of patches on top of it, and then it, uh, in, and there's, it's not quite as linear as this, there's a, an SOC vendor that has a bunch of patches, there's actually uh, some, so probably cycles between Google and the SOC vendor, and then it gets to a device manufacturer like LG or Sony or HTC, and then it finally works out to the end user. And by the time you've done that, there's just been a lot of steps, there's been a lot of patches applied, um, and you've got a version gap. And then what happens after this all happen, uh, occurs, so this is why we get kind of stuck on releases. We got stuck on 3.4 for quite a long time. I think the first 3.4 phones came out probably two years ago, and we've been on it for, for two years. It's because the, the cost of doing it again is we either throw those patches away or we, uh, we rebase them, we have to forward port them all, and uh, start all over again, start the cycle over again. Um, so, what are we trying to do about it? Okay, so now, Things should be, you know, happy and uplifting. Um, so there's uh, this thing called the Device Mainlining Project. It's a joint project between Lenaro and the Linux Foundation, and the goal is to make it easier for developers to upstream currently out of tree code. And we want to basically look at what obstacles there are and try to eliminate those obstacles. And uh, so there are technical aspects to this, but there are also non-technical aspects. Uh, we want to do identification and, and education. So we did a survey of developers uh, to see what things, uh, actual product developers on these mobile phones, why they weren't contributing. Uh, we did some presentations in a white paper trying to uh, develop materials that we could use to educate management. Uh, we've collected some training materials. Uh, but there's also technical, those are all kind of non-technical. There's kind of the incentives and process issues. Uh, but then there's technical things. So we've done an out-of-tree code analysis, and part of the results is what I've shown. Um, and then we have projects to address specific, to specific technical issues, and we've also started talking about tools uh, for contributors. And then we have, have SIGs and BOSS to discuss these issues, and this is kind of a meta point, because that's what we're doing right now. Um, so what are some of the activities? Uh, I mentioned that we did a survey of corporate developers that don't contribute. Uh, we have... Uh, a talk and a white paper uh, that I refer to as the obstacles talk where we kind of analyze what the different obstacles are. Um, and there's a pretty good LWN.net article uh, that was um, written up uh, after the talk I gave in, in uh, Japan on this, LinuxCon Japan. Uh, it has a lot of the information. Um, and then we have our out of tree code analysis. So we've actually written some tools to analyze the code that's out of tree and see what are the different areas how many, it's not just a, a bare lines of code, but uh, where are the lines of code? Are they in particular subsystems? What types of problems? Uh, and the purpose of these tools is uh, they're not fully automated yet, and that's, that, would, that would be nice, but there's still kind of a lot of hoops you have to jump through to, to download the code and, and kind of analyze it. Um, the purpose is to kind of make it regular, so you can, when you, when you automate the process of uh, categorizing the code, then you remove some of the subjectivity. Um, and so we have now put together a wiki page uh, called the uh, Kernel Areas of Focus for Mainlining, hopefully a descriptive page uh, name. 
And that has notes uh, about some of the major areas of out of tree code, and it has ideas for projects to work on. Uh, so these, this is, uh, from the analysis tools, some of the major problem areas uh, that we have identified. Uh, the mock-xxx, that's the, uh, the ARM uh, you know, machine area, and that's where the bulk, uh, a lot of, of code is, but uh, again, e even at 400K of code, uh, that's still uh, less than 40% and probably less than 20% of the code that's outstanding for most of these chips. Uh, and then you have media drivers, video, wireless, sound, input camera, an awful lot of driver code uh, that is out of tree. Uh, and then GPU and power. And this is, this is not even taking into account the fact that uh, this is stuff that's published as GPL code in people's kernel trees. Uh, this doesn't take into account stuff that's not published that, uh, where vendors have figured out ways to put stuff in user spaces or as firmware blobs or things like that. Um, and then I, I drilled down, I don't, this is intended to be a kind of a vendor neutral thing, I don't want to pick on any one vendor, but uh, Sony Mobile happens to use a lot of Qualcomm chips, so uh, I was able to uh, drill down on some of this. Um, and so the, this is the details for uh, Qualcomm. And like one of these I want to point out is USB, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that uh, you'd think, well isn't the USB stack in mainline, isn't that mature by now? And you'd think so. Uh, but it turns out, not really. Every single mobile phone ships with uh, USB materials code that's out of tree, uh, and, and I'll talk about why that is. And that, that seems kind of odd. You know, USB is, and this is, this is USB 2.0 code, right? So this is not even because we're talking about USB-C or super speed or something really, you know, this is, this is based on standards that were developed in the year 2000. That, well, that's, that's part of it. It's the, it's the gadget stuff, uh, but it also has to do with the integration with Charger. Uh, and so we'll, we'll drill into that in a, in a minute. Um, well, right now, actually. Uh, <laughs> so two projects we've already started uh, are uh, wireless drivers. Um, it turns out that an awful lot of these phones are using a Broadcom uh, wireless chipset. Uh, much, I'm probably to the chagrin of some of the SOC vendors who have Wi-Fi on their, on their SOCs. But uh, Google kind of mandated that everybody use Broadcom in, for one of the generations of products. And so everybody's using, but everybody's using an out-of-tree driver. And there's like 100K right there. Uh, that if we could just get a, a project around maturing that driver, we can you know, like shrink by five or 10% the total number of lines out of tree. Uh, so, uh, in the CE workgroup, uh, I actually have a proposal in to uh, the Linux Foundation, and we'll be discussing it in, in Dublin here in a couple of weeks uh, to fund some work on this. Not sure exactly what needs to be done because there actually is a backported driver for 3.4, uh, well, for 3.14 as well. Um, but, uh, and then the other thing is USB. So, it turns out the story with USB is. Uh, the, the main, there, there's two kind of things that happen on mobile that are not happening on laptop or desktop. And it mostly has to do with that uh, on the go port, uh, that it's just different. Uh, for most phones, uh, because uh, it, it, both of these have to do with the fact that the USB port is the primary charging port for the phone. And so the state machines that are upstream do not have anything in them about charging, which is completely inadequate for a phone in production use. Every phone charges over the USB port, and yet upstream, uh, the upstream state machine for on the go does not have anything about charging it. And so that's something that needs to be fixed. And, and, uh, and then another thing, because of, that, uh, because of that relationship in the charging, some of the control pins on the USB port are not routed directly to the controller hardware. They're routed to the PMIC hardware, because the PMIC has to do with some extra sensing and and determine what type of charging you're doing. And so some of the drivers upstream uh, don't, well, they're, they're written <coughs> expecting that the controller pins are actually gonna have valid data, and they don't. <laughs> so, and that's true for every single phone. 
that I'm aware of routes the routes those pins somewhere else. And I I can only imagine the only way I can imagine it works on other platforms. I, I know what happens on Sony is uh, we have to write special code that's out of tree that that handles that. And lately, we uh, people have been routing that stuff through XCon, which is actually XCon is what is kind of derived from the Android Switch class stuff. Um, and so so this is kind of a quasi Android solution that's kind of matured in a Linuxy way and hopefully we can get some of those USB drivers converted over that and get rid of some of this out of tree USB stuff. That's, that's kind of the roadmap for that. Um, so those are two projects that we've got going on right now um, by Lenaro and the CE work group. So, but we have, we have other technical areas. So this kernel areas of focus for mainlining. Uh, things that have been raised, this is, was, uh, the people have raised this on the kernel summit discussion list. There's a kernel summit coming up at the end of October. And uh, people have talked about a bunch of different areas. Some that stand out are uh, sensors and the need to see if we can convert stuff over to industrial I.O. Uh, uh, but that involves some migration of not just kernel drivers, but also some of the uh, Android user space stuff to use that, those frameworks. And then charging, uh, independent of the on-the-go kind of integration with charging, there's just charging in general is now handled a lot by user space blobs. Um, so lots of vendor charging code is in user space now. And then there's a whole there's a whole host of things uh, that are just way that are out of tree and kind of weird. They're weird. Uh, NFC, uh, GPS, and Bluetooth uh, tend to have user space drivers that talk to the board over UART and, and then install some kind of weird line discipline thing in order to handle the sideband. Uh, I don't know what you want to call them. But, the equivalent by octals, you know, the special things you need to do to to, uh, to communicate things to the to the uh, chipset. The side band is the protocol that's well, on top of the UART. Oh, so like the Bluetooth HCI. Yeah, Bluetooth yeah. HCI. I'm not sure exactly what the best way to anyway. So apparently on the kernel summit list, and and you were on that discussion, so you probably know what this is. I I, I need someone to explain this to me. What's going on with the UART slave stuff? Uh, no, let's come back to it. <laughs> so, but I would, I would like to understand this better, what's going on with that. I, I kind of felt like I understood it, but I'm pretty sure I'm missing some, some of the details. Um, okay, so besides the technical areas, there are institutional barriers. Uh, and so we have a separate wiki page to discuss those types of issues. And a lot of this revolves around really trying to convince companies that it's to their advantage to mainline stuff. Um, and so we want to help uh, describe, so there's two things. We want to kind of reduce their impression of the costs. So we want to help them overcome the process barriers and uh, the training barriers, the cost of getting involved with mainline, but also educate management and give them incentive, tell them about the benefits. Uh, hopefully we can uh, we'd like to do some things that will actually demonstrate that they'll have that vendors will have decreased maintenance costs going forward, um, and uh, actually there's other benefits like improved quality and improved time to market uh, that we hope that we can uh, actually demonstrate with real numbers uh, to companies. And I, that's one of the things I really want to discuss today. Uh, I had some ideas on the commute up here. One of the great things about these boffs is. Uh, it's like a deadline and it causes me to go into deep thinking mode to make sure I'm ready. Uh, so I have some ideas I want to toss out. Okay, so then uh, before we get to the discussion, just a couple of links where you can learn more. Uh, the main project website is on elinux.org, CE Workgroup Device Mainlining Project. We have a mailing list and so when people submit patches that are kind of related to some of these areas, it's nice if we get them copied there. Or if we want to have discussions uh, offline, well, not offline, online, uh, but not you know not face-to-face -face discussions uh, about some of these ideas, that's a good place to have those discussions. And then, okay, so if you wanted to help this problem out, what could you do? Well, we still need help identifying the deficiencies. Okay, so we've done some kind of really top-level things. You know, saying that media, there's a lot of media code out of tree, that's not as helpful 
it'd be nice to know, well, what is the media code? And in particular, what we're looking for is, is there media code that is out of tree that's common between multiple vendors? It, GPU code is very obvious, right? You know almost every SOC is using a non-SOC uh, non vendor IP block, right? The GPUs, people are using Molly, they're using uh, Adreno, uh, they're using Power VR or something like that. And every, those are easy to identify. But there's a lot of these other IP blocks that get used on the SOCs that it's not obvious that they've been crypt from somewhere else. So people have, you know, USB controllers or they might, most of the Wi-Fi's I think are, are homegrown, uh, homegrown IP, uh, but some, some are not. And then even on the designs, if we're talking about the total mobile phone design, a lot of times the vendors will go off chip, right? So there'll be stuff, for instance, on a particular mobile, Sony mobile phone, there's a Bluetooth controller on the SOC, but Sony chose to put a chip on board. And so uh, we can get support for a, a phone without having to support the SOC uh, stuff. Uh, so helping to identify exactly what it is, and if, and if there's areas where companies could collaborate, that's very helpful. Um, the second bullet point, that seems like an obvious one. If you can help put, a, put some of this code upstream, that'd be great. Uh, that is kind of the whole purpose <laughs> of uh, of this, uh, but also looking at the deficiencies, fixing upstream code so it's product grade. So the reason that all of the vendors are, even if you're shipping Broadcom uh, Wi-Fi solutions, uh, the reason that they're not using the mainline code is because the mainline code isn't good enough uh, for product grade. And so the, the issue there is, well, let's figure out what's, what's not working with it and fix it. And it'd be nice to make that the kind of the preferred solution. Um, and then, you know, whether or not Broadcom approves of the upstream driver, if that's what the, if that's what their chipset customers are using, uh, they're kind of forced to switch over and start supporting it. Um, so the other thing is, if you know some benefits of mainlining and can help us document those, that's good. Uh, write and enhance tools to make mainlining easier. Uh, add documentation for newcomers and suggest new ideas. And I think we're now at the discussion phase. So I did, so uh, there was one issue. Did we come back? I guess we did talk about the USB that you, that you asked about. Um, so I had, some, I had some specific things that I wanted to kind of toss up as uh, discussion points for this group. And I had some ideas that I wanted to, uh, that like I said, I had in the commute on the way up here. It was a long commute. I don't know, did anybody look at Google Maps this morning for the Bay Area roads? Holy smokes. <laughs> it, was, it was dark red everywhere. <laughs> and there was at least 20 accidents. Uh, but anyway, so I had a lot of time to think. Um, so, does anybody know other areas that are technical? Oh, you were gonna enlighten me about UART Slave, so tell, tell me about that, Rob. Let's get Rob a mic. So I think there's... Oh, okay. You have to, you have to catch it. <laughs> okay, so it, there's two aspects. I think there's uh, at the bottom level there's DT bindings for it. Um, so in that case, there, there's no way to describe devices hanging off a of UART today, um, like we have for I2C or SPY or other buses. Um, and then all these devices, besides just the UART, they have other connections, GPIOs to control power modes or, or uh, re regulators going to them or things like that that are on the board. So there's coming up with the, the, a uh, binding for describing slave devices hanging off a of UART, or generally it's just one, it's point to point. So, so what are, I mean, so like for a Bluetooth that's hanging off of a UART, UART how, how are they doing like the power management now on it? So generally it's, usually like a Bluetooth enabled GPIO line. Um, so maybe they describe that GPIO in, in uh, device tree. Uh, I think there's some platform driver bolted on that's not really integrated or it could even be driven from user space. So they just go out to sys, sys GPIO or something, whatever. Okay. 
Yeah, RF kill is a common way it's implemented as well. Okay. Um, so then it typically, and then on the serial side, you have TTY devices, and those just get exposed to user space. There's no in kernel API for for uh, writing a drop on top of a UART bus, for a lack of a better word. Uh, and you, you can bind, uh, user space asks to do it, you can bind a kernel driver to a UART with um, a line discipline, but right. it's a really, really disgusting API. It's, it's, it's actually hideous and it does need user space to do it. I think that's what they're doing. So that's yeah. <laughs> so then you so then you end up with things like HCI attach, which has all the glue there to that knows how to uh, do firmware download, which is different on all the Bluetooth devices, and can power on the device. And um, so probably what's needed is to in the kernel is to split serial core. It's already split from serial core and TTY layers and be able to have a UART subsystem in parallel to TTY. So, uh, yeah. and write proper remember, in kernel drivers. Did, did someone say they were working on that? Did Marcel say he was doing something or? There's, there's, uh, I think he wants to do that. <laughs> okay. um, so, if you look at like a Bluetooth, uh, USB adapter, then it's got a proper internal driver and it does firmware download in the kernel with standard interface. And right. So that's probably where we need to get with UART devices. Is it uh, kind of lack of some good examples or I mean, you think if we picked one and... Well, it's lack of a subsystem, <laughs> right? So do we need a new maintainer? Is there such a thing as a serial maintainer? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone needs to be motivated to go work on it. But it, it's particularly entertaining code, so it's not, you know, it's a year of the deal. One of the really dark corners of the kernel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so. Okay, so. No one wants to touch the TTY yeah. layer. Right, no one wants to touch the TTY. Well, this would be like. This would be like not touching the TTY, right? It's basically you're talking about a new. But it would have to coexist. Yeah, with the TTY has to coexist. You're, you're, you're walking near the TTY layer. <laughs> <laughs> so we need we need it's a maintainer in. daredevil, is what we need. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, are there other areas that people are aware of that are kind of big out of tree? I mean, I, we talked about the GPUs, the sensors. Uh, we could try pulling up. So I heard I heard about one this week. So Mark and I have been trying to meet. Uh, Mark and I have been meeting with some Linaro members to try to to try to do exactly this to try to get be able to look closer at their trees and find out what are their big areas that they're hacking on. And one that came up this week that I hadn't heard of before was the memory management subsystem. There's a lot of hacking on the memory management system, particularly for running Android on phones with small amounts of memory. So basically tweaking knobs and hacking around various things in memory management to avoid the out of memory killer and to tweak parameters here and there. I, I don't know the details yet because I haven't actually seen the code, but okay. uh, apparently there's quite a bit of hacking in memory management that of course is, it, is not it, up, up Is it related to the OOM um killer stuff? Yeah, or? well it's related to avoiding the OOM um killer. Oh, okay. Right? Some of the reclaim, right? Yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know exactly, but I just, I mean, okay. it's a fairly significant amount of patches that's going on in this area for, uh, yeah, for memory management. And do we know are those uh, are those SOC patches or are those more kind of Android? They're core. Framework? I mean, they're core memory management kernel okay. framework patches, from what I understand. So, well, and there's a session tomorrow, right? That that John is going to have on. Thursday. Is it? Oh, is it Thursday? Oh, Thursday. Okay, session session later this week. <laughs> the safe thing to say uh, on Android. Right on the status of some of the Android stuff. Is that the focus of that, or is it basically recapping some of the discussions from Mars? Okay. So. So I've also seen some stuff like. Uh, you can't. Uh, 
you can't do DVFS while you have active SD uh, transactions going on because the change in voltage causes corruption in the transfer. So there's they've okay. put hooks in to to hold off DVFS transitions. Okay. Um, and then when it does do the transition, then it does retuning on the interface. And that's a fun one to try to solve. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that we should be able to solve with per device EOS constraints now, upstream. Okay. I, one, one area I, I've recently run into is uh, panel drivers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Video in general. Yeah. Is get, it's the, probably one of the bigger pain, uh, pain points. Yeah. Yeah. I, you'd think it would be easy to get them going, but it's quite hard. So. Yeah. Until now, each uh, SOC vendor has their, had their own driver custom panel framework. So even if you have multiple device, uh, a device with possibly multiple different socks from different vendors, you end up having but the same panel. You end up writing the, the same panel driver multiple times. So in the, I think that should be getting better because there's more movement towards DRM KMS on the display side. The DRM subsystem has a panel framework uh, with a small but growing number of, of panel drivers. Um, you know, we actually have a panel driver now for the Dragon Board and a couple of the Sony uh, yeah, devices. We're, we're not, very happy about that, by the way. Thank <laughs> you very much. Not, not all upstream yet, but I mean, it, uh, there's progress being made there. Um, the bindings are still kind of all over the place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's on my head list now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's probably not so much for the panel as much as some of the component stuff and how to arrange yeah, all of these. It's more uh, not just this, the interaction between those and so Yeah. Um, so I didn't have a chance to look at it closely. Uh, I mean, Eric and Holt had proposed something which looks like it might be reasonable to just remove all those connections from device tree. But anyway, though it's getting a little bit off topic. Um, one thing that's a little bit different that I wanted to mention, which is going to be a problem. I mean, now we're starting to get to the point where we can run, you know, have display and almost GPU and some simple stuff on um, the mainline kernel or you know, patches on top of a mainline kernel on some devices. But there's going to be a problem for a whole generation of, you know, the first 64-bit devices in that. Um, ARM 64 has rejected uh, non-PSCI uh, uh, support for bringing up CPUs and CPU idle and stuff. So um, that's maybe not going to be a problem for devices that you can get new firmware for, but that probably doesn't include any tablet or phone <laughs> in right, existence. Can, can you repeat that a little bit? Um, so uh, having alternate, alternate SMP ops for bringing, you know, for CPU hot plug and so on for devices that don't implement PSCI in the firmware um, okay. are knacked. So well, know, well that, that, that was partly the approach taken to that particular attempt at mainlining, though. I mean, they definitely yeah. don't want it, and they're pushing back aggressively. But... They, um, obviously, you know the, the way that was submitted and the response to the feedback wasn't likely to work well. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you get community folks who have even less feedback from their internal feed from our teams, yeah. I don't think it's going to go much better. Yeah, yeah but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was things yeah. like the you know um, if you provided the documentation that was asked for, for example. Yeah. Because th it was basically you're going to. Uh, the way it was presented was you're going to apply these patches, go away, you're going to apply these patches, shut up, yeah. which didn't go over well, surprisingly. Yeah. Well, anyways, I mean, I suspect that will need to be resolved somehow yeah. when we get closer to the point of actually being able to run a mainline kernel on the, some of those devices. Okay. I want to I want to veer uh, sideways for a little bit here and talk about the uh, non-technical issues. So I think actually one of the big hurdles is convincing management uh, to put necessary resources on this. Um, and so uh, 
one of the things that we talked about uh, at LinuxCon North America, Seattle uh, last month was um, what are some metrics that we could try to gather that would actually be concrete data to show uh, the costs and the benefits of doing this. Um, and uh, we had some ideas on that. Um, uh, in particular, one of these bullet points, we'd like to see examples of code reduction uh, because of conversion to mainline drivers. So it was asserted by, I can't remember who in the, in the BOF up there, that uh, when you go from a, uh, an out of tree driver to an in tree driver, uh, very often you see a substantial code reduction. At least that's the assertion. But is there any data to back that up? And, and so one idea was to actually measure. The problem is you have to find some drivers that have made that transition. And you know, do they have the same? It's, it's a difficult problem, difficult, difficult thing to measure, because you have to say, is, if a driver's undergone a big transformation going into mainline, does it have all the functionality it used to have? Does it have more? Uh, it might, because the frameworks might be taking care of more stuff. Uh, it might be higher quality. That's the assertion, is that if it goes into mainline, it's, it's uh, smaller, higher quality. The, the classic argument to management is that your maintenance cost is reduced because all of these patches. And so I was thinking about that on the way up and um, thinking, well, could we measure the number of patches made against uh, a particular piece of code that is out of tree versus the number of patches that are made against a particular piece of code in tree. Uh, and it's not, the patch count might go down, but I think the more interesting metric for a vendor is how many of those patches were made by a vendor, right? If it's out of tree, the answer is 100% of them. Uh, if it's in tree, then some percentage of those patches are gonna be community people. And in fact, if you look at any individual driver, uh, you, you look at an upstream driver, the amount of churn that goes on in Linux, you know, just when you do a git log on some patch that's out there, some, some driver file, uh, you see a ton of, uh, of random people who you don't expect, right? You, I'm in the USB tree a lot, and so I see all this stuff by, uh, uh, is it Felipe Balbi? Yeah, see a bunch of stuff by him, and that, that I expect, but then I see stuff from Greg, and I see stuff from, uh, you know, and he's also a USB maintainer. But then you see totally random stuff by people changing kernel interfaces, right? And you go, oh, well, you know, if you were to forward port that patch from 3.4 to now, you would have had to do this yourself. And, uh, and so I, I, I don't know. So I'm just trying to thinking of ways to capture that. And I think a really easy metric is percentage of patches that were, that were performed on a driver that were by the community, or, but not by a vendor and by a vendor by the vendor that owns that patch. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any ideas, feedback? The, the problem with getting that metric is I don't have Git trees. Uh, I, have, I have tarballs. And uh, so also this requires that you kind of look at stuff over time, right? I wanna see the status of a driver in 3.4 and I kinda have to wait for a generation of 3.10 phones to come out to see, well, what things got mainlined in there and what, it, what changed. So I have to look at. Does it really make sense to look at the three, four chipsets today and try to get them working well? No, I mean, no, the no, Delta no. is so big. Wouldn't it be better to look at like somebody working on 314 or 318? And yeah, I'm not, for, for what I've just described, the, the only reason to look at three, four is because I've got that data. And so I can compare, uh, a current, uh, something that's in tree with something that was out of tree. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, uh, in terms of the Delta, yeah, I think we should be looking at what people are shipping or about to ship. Okay. Um, and my understanding, I heard in the hallway that it's, it's not actually 314, it's, I heard that it's 318, which is like, uh, <laughs> really, you guys are going to a non-LTS? Anyway, that's there's not. there's an LTS 318. Is there is there? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not a great one. It's not a great one. Slash 11 it's, is it's maintaining it. Slash 11 from Oracle who um, doesn't really care about that. It's a. But, uh, <laughs> Does, uh, we can talk LTS somewhere else. Yeah. Um, 
one thing, playing the devil's advocate here on the non-technical issues, one of the big benefits that I've seen vendors do is that when they rebase and they move forward, they can shed a lot of old platforms. They can shed drivers for old IPs for products they're no longer selling. And in mobile, the, the lifespan of a product is fairly short. Um, so I know, for example, NVIDIA did a rebase, I think it was to 314, and they shed all non-64-bit platforms because they didn't need them anymore. Um, so that's so being out of tree is sometimes a benefit too, actually. Um, the same comes for, um, and this is something that I've personally been involved in product work where regressions on older platforms just start sneaking in when you enable new hardware on the same drivers, right? Um, and there's a cost to that too. So there's a cost to mainlining, there's a cost to keeping mainline alive um, that it's sort of hard to measure, unfortunately. Yeah. So the, I mean, yeah. the, would the shedding drivers thing really matter if the drivers were upstream already? I mean, it's only, it's only the not upstream part that you're shedding anyways. Yeah, is, is it just right. a problem if they take heat for not maintaining it upstream or? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't have to keep, make sure it keeps working, right? Yeah. Well, okay. They're done well, with they, it. They, there's no longer a cost center for them, right? This, right. this chip is sold, we no longer have to maintain it and make sure that we fix it when it breaks. And never paid the cost of upstreaming that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, well, and it, it does depend if it's you know, a completely new driver that they're, and they're discarding an old driver, or if it's um, the case for the old revision of the same hardware and, uh, of, the, of the hardware and the same driver. Mm -hmm. right. And somebody reports a bug on it, and you're like, I don't want to fix that, or I don't, I don't have time to fix that. I don't care yeah. about that platform. Yeah. Right. But I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think from that point of view, this is what the bit that Lenaro is um, going to be focusing on. Um, it's pro uh, there's a, a lot more value to the uh, companies in fixing things in the generic frameworks than in the drivers. The drivers, eh, you can make cases uh, like you just made. Uh, the generic frameworks they're going to be stuck with, like it or not. Look at the stuff where they've had to patch the framework, right? Yeah. yeah. Or, 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 or in some case, I mean, the other thing. Or work around be, it, now use it. We're, we're going to be doing is looking at the bits where they, um, they're clearly working around the framework. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, that, that sort of stuff, there, I think there's a, it's easier to make the um, management case. Yep. So basically, we need to freeze the upstream interfaces. Sorry, that's just a little joke. Like you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess one thing that I kind of ruminate on is um, this aspect of how did the enterprise vendors seem to kind of pick right. up the right approach so quickly. And one of the, my theories is, is that the fact that, you know, for a long time, a number of vendors didn't. <coughs> and it was only when they started dealing with the fact that they had multiple targets that they had to ch chase. And so they were having to port to Red Hat, they were having to port to SUSE. And so for one product platform, they were having to do what looked like twice the work. Um, and so my, my suspicion is that because with mobile devices, you know, there's a new SOC, there's a new budget, you can do a lot of repetitive work that you did the last time around too, but since it's a new budget, nobody notices or that sort of thing. Right. And is there any way to make that duplication more well, clear? I, okay, so I definitely think that there is no, well, in a hardware company, there's no software accounting at all. That nobody counts the cost of software development in a hardware company. I, I, I speak from deep experience here. <laughs> and, but, and so I actually was thinking about that. Is, is there a way to assign a cost to a patch uh, and, and kind of like the life cycle of a patch? You know, how much does it cost you to maintain it? And you're saying that sometimes they're able to shed patches and so it, there's an argument for keeping stuff out of tree or not, not not uh, bearing the cost of putting it in tree uh, if you're just going to throw it away. Uh, and so the question is, well, how many of these patches do live, you know, do go through a transition from one version of the kernel to the next, and how much does it actually cost? So even if people are measuring this cost of software development for a particular feature or a bug fix or something, they almost never even if they're advanced enough to measure the development cost, they're never measuring the maintenance cost, in my experience. And so they just don't even see. This, this activity of forward porting patches is just, a, is just completely lost in the noise of their product development cycles. 
and uh, it's done by some poor engineer in a basement, and no, you know, nobody cares how much how many cycles it costs them. <laughs> forward porting, they call it bring up, right? Yeah, they call they it bring up. They don't. Yeah, they do not call it forward porting. They call it's it bring up. It's, it's enabling a new piece of hardware. Yeah, it's hard. That's right. And it's all it's all good. It's all good stuff. It's like, and and you some have to have to convince them. It's like, well, if this, you know, your bring up. This is this is what I really want. In in my dream world, I want to go to Sony management and say. Our bring up cost for a new phone is like, you know, I'm throwing numbers out there, these are not real numbers, uh, is 100 man months, okay? Or, and if, if this stuff was in mainline, I think we could get it to 50. You know, there's an argument that I can go to management and say, look, this is costing, this will cost you less, you'll be able to get to market faster if, if this, this stuff that's currently on our plate is gone. That's, that's the, the fundamental argument, but it's so hard to get actual data. But that's an argument to Sony, it's not an argument to MediaTek or Qualcomm or Samsung. Yes. Well, uh, and it, argument, well it is to Samsung because well, they're well, integrated. One of, the, one of the sort of strong arguments to that to Steve Andrews, and this is something that I've seen um, happen as well, is you want to work on new infrastructure, you want to work on new features, new kernel features. Um, if you don't have your code upstream, nobody will enable the new features on your hardware. Um, and it's going to be painful to work on. We, we've seen this in particular on um, where the fork just went too deep that we could either do the feature work on our old kernel or we could do it on, um, on mainline but not on our SOC. Um, so getting your SOC enabled when people do new frameworks um, in this particular case, it was graphics, which is always a sore point on ARM, but um, there's that benefit. Um, another strong benefit is um, people fixing the bugs before your users find them. Um, the quality delta between being out of tree and being in mainline has a corresponding cost, because the higher your quality gets raised by mainline or driver, the more effort you've spent doing that. Because if the quality is already high, it's easy to mainline, you just send the patch in and it's accepted, right? If your quality is low, you're gonna spend a lot of effort spinning the patches, getting feedback, right. rewriting stuff. So it's gonna cost more to mainline. Yeah, so you get quality, but it comes at a cost. Right. Well, uh, and a cost that usually lasts longer than the product life cycle, <laughs> depending on the quality. Yeah. On well, mobile, that's yes. the thing. Uh, mobile, sure. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, but, a lot of Although so, sometimes on mainlining, though, uh, the the quality improves not because of uh, additions to the code, but because of subtractions. When they when they migrate off their weirdo frameworks and onto the mainline frameworks, they pick up. Some, well, the I, the theory is they'll pick up some quality improvements. You know, the locking is better, the whatever is better, uh, because they're using a framework for that stuff instead. I just want to say quickly, I mean, you keep talking about like a particular product life cycle as if every block on the SOC was completely re-implemented each, each cycle, which is not the case. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you might end up with, uh, you know, different uh, tables of clocks and regulators and stuff, but the basic thing is kind of the same. Um, In some cases, yeah. Yeah, it varies. Yes. Actually, yeah. it varies yeah. a lot on the on the soft vendor. Yeah, and of course you you have the cases where um, with the generic IP vendors like DesignWorks and Opsys, where um, that hardware is in so many different socks. Yeah, yeah. Another kind of non technical technical rationale that I think. Uh, I've seen that might be helpful is that aspect of, you know, so often, even though vendors do have, you know, full solutions for everything, uh, devices still are composites of a number of different vendors' components. Um, and having to deal with the interlock of, you know, this SOC supports this kernel, but that driver for, you know, this other bit of hardware yeah. that we want to use is on the wrong kernel version. And so those constraints really limit what people are able to use. And so by having your support upstream, your components are now more flexible, can be used with a lot of different SOCs, you know. Yeah, and, and that, that um, 
I've, I've had a quite a bit of success with that, in ter- and also in terms of just saying these people are using out-of-tree frameworks, they're ignoring the standards. Can you really be sure component A is going to work with component B uh, when the two need to talk to each other? Uh, but that's actually been quite persuasive for me, um, you know, convincing people to use this uh, particular chip that, had, that was well supported in mainline. Yeah, it, um, it's, it's and the and integration cost is up front. Yeah. It's already done. Well, so. and for chip vendors, if you've got a part that's going to have a catalog life, it's also very helpful because it means you can just put through, point people at mainline and say, well, you didn't get that software from us. It fell off the back of a bus. Who knows what those mainline, you know, it's not, if you deliver the software to your customer, then you're on the hook for it. If the customer downloaded it from some place on the internet, you probably want to support them somewhat, but it's not the same game. You don't well, need to talk to them. Someplace on the internet is usually the IP block vendor's website. <laughs> but but the, the point is, that the, if, the, if it's in the main line, then the, the, they may not even need to go to the IP block vendor. Right. Um, then the IP, you know, the IP block vendor doesn't have that cost. Right. Well, right, that's the argument for the IP block vendor. How much are you talking to vendors here? Is this much an independent effort by now? Or? Well, Sony's been working with Qualcomm quite a bit. Uh, beyond that, I mean, we haven't really talked to a lot of people. Um, I do have an appointment to talk with someone with Google. Uh, so, and we've started talking. Yeah. With, we've started talking with Lunaro members and trying to get not just tarballs, but see if we can hopefully get Git trees and get a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. If we could get Git trees, I d- I don't know if I'd be able to. Maybe maybe Sony needs to finally pony up and become a Lunaro member or something. Um. Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, it'll depend on the vendors. I mean, they may, for example, say you can only share this with Lenaro employees. Uh, obviously, there's a signees. But yeah, we, we're focusing. Or very I could much make some scripts you guys could run. <laughs> yeah. But we're, we're focusing very much on the generic stuff where, cause we're, uh, because we're a shared engineering thing. We can't really be upstreaming people's drivers for them except for the ARM, Synopsys, Designer stuff. Where obviously the v- vendor neutral stuff. Yeah, that's the case for it. The other big category is just the little power and performance tweaks that yeah. kind of sprinkle everywhere, right? That's a pretty big category that's not like any one but subsystem, right? But I don't it know also depends on what you're looking for, right? Because if you're looking at being able to run a mainline kernel on your phone, maybe yeah. not get the same battery life as you get with a right, yeah. At least if you can run it, yeah, yeah. you a long way. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and some of it's looking at it and going uh, and just say, oh, that, why did they do that? Oh, that's a good idea. Or I have no idea. Let's just ignore it. But, you know, um, right. pull it, you know, as upstream maintainers, going and looking at the vendor trees and pulling out stuff that uh, makes sense is good. Yeah. The, the other, I don't know if this is technical or non-technical, but this, this whatever you call the Android problem, right? Why would I do mainline when AOSP is at 318? I mean, that, that's, well, right. a, that's, a, no, that, there's that's a pretty a, big obstacle. There's a chicken and egg problem. Well, that's, I don't know. There's a yeah. dependency cycle between the vendors and Google. But, but um, I mean, having been on the vendor side, one of the, I mean, we were getting a lot of benefit from the forward porting thing. Uh, if, we, uh, if we upstreamed our stuff, then at least our products were long, long enough lived they often spanned two Android releases and we would typically get at least basic support um, already in the new uh, Google kernel. And it was, you know, that made it our life a lot easier. Uh, we, did, we, we weren't in a mad panic whenever some uh, new version was announced. Well, I think we're, uh, we're out of time here. Appreciate uh, appreciate everyone's thoughts and uh, kind of uh, we'll be continuing to talk about this and uh, trying to find areas where we can uh, uh, mainline stuff. I you know ultimately the goal is not really uh, to ship product on top of tree. Uh, that'll you know that's not the case in desktop or enterprise. It's not going to be the case in mobile. But uh, we really hope that by kind of doing some more focused efforts here, we can get a little bit closer to mainline and uh, improve the situation uh, for both, for, for everybody in the, in, in the whole uh, ecosystem, not just uh, the SOC vendors or the, uh, or the product vendors, but uh, the end users as well. So 
And, yeah, I'd just like to advertise the session. There's a session about what we're doing about this in Lenaro tomorrow at quarter past 11. Yep, quarter past 11 uh, in next door. So uh, come along to that if you have the call. Um, arm kernel consolidation, let's make it happen, I think. <laughs> uh, although that the name lead project is subsequently being changed, so it's not even a good title anymore. But <laughs> anyway. um, that sounds like a very motivating title. So. Anyway, on that note, thank you very much.